This is Dale Jr., and you're listening to Dirty Mo' Radio. Yeah, I won the school bus race a couple times against Kenny Wallace and Jimmy Spencer, so that I always like to rub that in their face. But little did they know at that time what you we were did a little to super prepare <laughs> for the school bus race. So, yeah, the, the, the bag's out, man. Everyone knows my secret. Welcome to Fast Lane Family with Kelly Earnhardt Miller. Hey, guys. Welcome to Fast Lane Family, presented by Charlie's Soap. The excitement hasn't worn off with my new partnership in Charlie's Soap. Um, I hope you have gotten the opportunity to go online and check them out. You can do that at charliesoap.com. They have a wonderful line of six products ranging from indoor-outdoor cleaner, bath and kitchen cleaner, and laundry detergents. They are all safe, non-toxic green products. I tested some out this week in camping, and I'll talk about how that went a little later in the show. Right now, I'd like to introduce my guest with me this week, Fox Sports 1 reporter, Wendy Venturini. How are you today? I'm great, Kelly. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate you joining us. Um, I'm really excited to get to uh, to know some more things about you. Um, you know, much like me, you grew up in a racing family. You're, you're very well known for your reporting. You know, your father was a two-time ARCA champion, still continues in the sport today uh, with Venturini Motorsports. Mm-hmm. And your mom was the one, a <laughs> female tire changer um, on one of the all-female pit crews. So I got to know more. I know. Tell it's me funny. about all that. <laughs> it's funny to, to, to be around all the folks in, in NASCAR for so many years, and you feel like you know their story until you really sit down and chat with them some more, and there's so many layers to peel off on, on everybody involved in the industry. But um, with my story, you know, my father, father is a retired cup driver and started um originally started in the arca series gosh he raced from the 70s and we lived in chicago at the time so my father made a career work in in the midwest which was kind of unheard of where we lived uh as a child I, to tell somebody my father was a race car driver they thought i had three heads out of uh, chicago of in all chicago, places right <laughs> so um basically everyone thought it was a joke back then But my father made it work and um, won a few championships. We moved down south in in 1993. So I've been in Charlotte, North Carolina for 21 years now, which is crazy. And just started to decide to stay in the family business. I didn't want to work on cars and I didn't want to drive them. So I... um, I actually had some some coaching when I was about 15 years old from Benny Parsons. And Benny said to me, he lived in the in the area where we lived in Concord, North Carolina, and Benny Parsons said, "You know, Wendy, you've grown up in this sport. You've absorbed all this information throughout your whole life. Why don't you do something useful and in the family business?" And um and I kind of joked haha about it and ended up going down that route in high school and started public speaking and um, wasn't really sure where I was going to go in the media side of it, um, but I knew that I enjoyed talking to people and telling stories, and so that's when I went off to college and studied uh, television production and, and went down that road of the family business, so I've been able to stay in the sport, and um, between my father's racing career, my brother's racing career, my father gave us both the opportunity to drive, but I just did not have the interest, <laughs> and uh, so my brother did that for a few years. My mother, um, I grew up with a very strong-willed um mom and she um you know back in the 80s you would remember this you know a lot of women weren't allowed in the garage area so my mother was listed as the car owner for my father's race team and um buster otten who's still a nascar official escorted my mother through the nascar garage area when she would attend back then just because it wasn't very common for women to be <laughs> gallivanting through the garage area and, and because she was listed as the car owner. And then in the 80s, my dad started this all-female pit crew with his sponsor, Permatext. Permatext wanted to do something to gain some exposure, so they thought it would, would be kind of a unique idea to put some females over the wall. Well, long story short, the Wood Brothers got on board and they trained my um, father's all-female pit crew, which included my mother as the tire changer, my aunt as the other, as the rear tire changer, my mom was the front tire changer, my other aunt was the fuel woman, gas woman, (laughs) I had another aunt that was the jack woman, however you want to call it, so I would, I was too young at the time, Um, I was 10 years old, and I would sit on the driveway and watch my mom and my aunt's pit stop practice and it's so it's kind of funny how you you know you tell these stories and looking back at it's kind of silly how it all worked out but um but yeah just being absorbed in the sport my whole life kind of 
gave me the opportunity to stay in the family business. And, and of course, you know, I had a, just like you, you have to do things for yourself. Yeah. Things aren't, aren't just handed to you. Like some people would like to think you do have to, um, have responsibility and, and have the drive to do, to do the things that you want to achieve. So it's been a fun road for yeah. sure. That, that is, you, you know, talking about the, um, it, it sounds so bizarre and silly and all of those things to talk about the all female pit crew back then, um, but back then it was, it, it was so surreal, I'm sure yeah. for them, you know, I mean, like you said, you didn't, the, the ladies didn't walk through the garage and we were over in the paddock area, you know, the moms and the kids mm-hmm. and, and, um, it was just not something, you know, your husband went out there and did their thing and, and they came back to get you and going home with the family and you didn't have really any part of that like the, the women do today. It so. is crazy how much it's grown. And really, if you think about it, it really hasn't grown that much because we would see even more females doing more things in our sport. Um, you know, Chocolate Myers interviewed me the other day and he said, when do you think we're going to see a female go over the wall for a top level sprint team. cup team? Because we do have them in NASCAR. We, do. we have them we going over yep. the wall and they're fabulous at what they do. But why is there not a top 10 cup team with a female um, pit crew person? I don't right. know. I don't know that answer. Why don't we have that yet? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> some reason. <laughs> I'm know, not sure. So. <laughs> They're not trying out for the uh, combines that the teams have for their, for their uh, from their college pit selection people. Yes. <laughs> you know, so right. let's talk about broadcasting and kind of your entry. So I know you said that you, you know, studied that in school and, and that kind of thing, but really what was your first entourage into that? Well, when it, when it, when it was Benny Parsons that, kind of put that thought in my mind that I could actually have a living in a profession in our sport and I didn't have to drive and I didn't have to work on cars. And, (laughs) but I remember telling Benny, my first response, again, I was 15 years old telling Benny, there's not a lot of women that do this, Benny. And and he said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. (laughs) And so, you know, at the time there was a few women on, on television that covered racing, but it, it was very few and far between. There wasn't a lot of journalists in the garage area back then. And so that's how I kind of started down that track. And um, studied. I had done a lot of public speaking in high school and kind of got into that scene, um, which put me comfortable in front of large crowds, which probably made it easier when I went off to college and started off at the college campus. And I did my own TV show on, on, on campus. I did a sports show. And then when I got out of college, I convinced, um, I went to a local cable news station, Adelphia Cable here mm-hmm. in Mooresville, North Carolina. And I convinced the station manager at this local cable news to let me start my own racing show. And I have a very, very small budget. <laughs> very, like, I don't even know if I really had a budget. I probably was paying them to do it. Um, but he gave me a camera and everyone was one man band reporter, which meant took my camera, did my interviews, shot all my own B-roll, shot my own stand-ups, went back and edited it and, and put it all together. So it was a great learning experience um, right out of college. But it's so funny when I, um, and there are tapes floating around somewhere in my in my office of people that I interviewed back then (laughs) right out of college. And here I am, you know, I'm going into these sprint cup shops and doing this local cable news show all by myself. It's really kind of ridiculous when I look back on it, but it was things like that, that I just took every opportunity or made opportunities for myself that weren't even there just to get me more experience and, and more knowledge. And then from there, I got an opportunity to go to NASCAR, Um, media group it was called at the time and it's a production house in NASCAR and they hired me as a production assistant I knew I wasn't going to go on camera camera for a um, for a NASCAR production company right out of the box and so started off as a production assistant logging tapes in the library which everyone knows is the worst (laughs) job in production but it got me one step closer to what I wanted to be doing which was production in NASCAR and so from there I just kind of moved up the ladder on the production end of things and ended up producing my own show on NASCAR Victory Lane which is still on the air today Um, but back then it was NASCAR Victory Lane it was on Fox Sports Net and I was producing the show and in 2004 an opportunity came up in the back of my mind I had always thought about still on air but whether or not it was going to happen I was making um, a name on the production scene so I was happy with myself but an opportunity came up in 2004 for the NASCAR which was back then Craftsman Truck Series now Camping World Truck Series and they were looking for a female pit reporter a young female pit reporter that knew NASCAR and I had to be convinced to apply for the job. Wow. Because I thought there's no way they are going to hire me. I don't have nearly enough experience for that. I've only done local cable news. 
So, um, long story short, it was a crazy day in my life. Literally in one day, um, I got the call and I was told, bring a resume tape here by 11 a.m. This was at, back then it was Speed Channel. And so it was 9 a.m. in the morning, and I remember telling my bosses, I have this opportunity to put this resume tape together. So they gave me a cameraman at NASCAR Media Group, said, go shoot something, make a resume tape. And um, so I went out to a local Walmart, and I shot this resume tape with a cameraman at NASCAR Media Group, went back, edited it, went to the Speed Channel office, and I was there before 11 a.m., and um, Rick Miner, who hired me at Speed Channel, said, well, you passed the first part of the test already. You got here on time. So <laughs> and by the end of the conversation, he offered me the job. Wow. So I went to work that morning as a producer, and I came home that evening with a job on air for Speed Channel. It was bizarre. And um, you hear stories, and you're like, that's, that's crazy. How does that ha- <laughs> That doesn't happen. But, yes, it, it really did. And so I started in 2004. Uh, on air as a pit road reporter and I did that for two years in, in the truck series it was a blast we had so much fun pit reporting and then in 2006 I got the opportunity to move up to the sprint cup level and work on NASCAR race day which was you know the the biggest pre-race show at the time and that went on um all the way till this this last winter I did that so from 2006 to 2013 and now I'm in I'm still with Fox and obviously we changed over from speed to Fox but still with Fox Sports 1 covering practice and qualifying sessions and doing a show called NASCAR Live and it's been one heck of a road the last 11 years to see full circle where I've come from behind the scenes as producer and and what I've been able to do the last nine years on air. It's amazing. Uh, it's a great story. A couple of things that I thought of uh, as you were talking, you know, I get asked a lot, what does it take to get involved in our sport? You know, I want to be an XYZ and how do I get started from, you know, lots of college um, folks and, and mm-hmm. just people expiring to do what we do and be involved in this business. And, um, you know, many of the things that you said uh, just really, you know, hit home of, it takes hard work. It takes what you said, creating opportunities for yourself, Mm -hmm. networking. And I I tell people, you know, network, meet as many people as you can start at something entry level. So many people think (laughs) they're much bigger than that. And and they, they probably are, but you've got to get that foot in the door. And you know, you've logging production tapes. Yeah. No fun. Right. (laughs) And then here sweeping the floors in the shop. Yeah. That's, you know, anybody can do that, but, you have to start building those relationships and getting to know those people and, and showing them that you're capable of doing whatever it is you're doing very well so right. that you get the next opportunity. And that's what I tell so many people. I, I just like you get a lot of college students asking, how did, how did you get here and how did it all come about? And, and I said, I took every opportunity. And if there wasn't an opportunity, I made an opportunity yeah. because I wanted it that badly. I, I had a passion and a desire and I didn't want anything handed to me. I wanted to earn it for myself, for my own self. And so, you know, Taking entry-level jobs are key. There's so many kids out of college, they want to go right on TV. And Mm -hmm. and people that ask me about broadcasting, they want to go from college, get your degree, and go on television in a big network for a big city or whatever the case may be. That's not going to happen. That's not reality. Right. When I took a job as a production assistant, yes, I was overqualified, and I knew that, but I did not care. I was getting my foot in the door, and it lasted about three weeks. And they realized how overqualified I was for the position and they moved me up. And then I did that position and they moved me up and they moved me up. And the next thing I know, I was producing a national TV show in a short amount of time. So it's, it's funny how, I mean, you just got to get your foot in the door, keep those relationships, do a good job and, and keep creating those opportunities. Right. Exactly. And you, you've mentioned, you know, a couple of times, you know, not driving and, and, and not following that path, but you have driven. (laughs) I knew you were going to bring it up. (laughs) So MRO has this event, the better half dash you've done really well in that yeah so <laughs> here's the funny the thing. defending champ right it's, it's the funny thing <laughs> is you know I have a three-year-old son three and a half year old son Caleb and my son thinks I'm a race car driver <laughs> because he has seen mommy get in these bandoleros for charity races and I've raced school buses for charity and I did a um, drag racing school at the drag strip and went um, I got the highest speed in this 
top in this dragster at this at this uh, speedway and got this huge five foot trophy one day and my son was there for this media event it was all media people so my son literally thinks i drive a race car i'm like honey i'm not a race car driver so um it's it's kind of funny um and he brings up you know my purple fire suit that that they did up for me it was <laughs> it was fun i you know, I never thought I was really competitive enough to race, and I didn't have the desire there. But, man, when I get invited to a charity event, You're I'm all for all it. All about it. And because we're racers, you know how it is. You have to do the best you can, and you're a little bit competitive. Um so that tends to come out in me. The school bus races, is, uh, the, I have funny stories about that. They used to do these media events. They still race school buses yep. at Charlotte Motor Speedway in the summer shootout. But they had us on our show, everybody in our show, um, that didn't ask her race day at the time, which was John Roberts, Kenny Wallace, and Jimmy Spencer, and <laughs> a whole group. Uh, Rutledge Wood was in there. So there's a group of us racing buses, and I ended up... Um, my husband, he's in the sport and, and is an engine guy. So we went and went to the speedway, went out in the back lot and picked out my bus. He completely like rebuilt stuff on this bus before the race. It, you know, it's supposed to be this school bus slobber knocker event. He put racing fuel in it. He put fresh oil through the thing. I mean, he had this thing great condition for me to race the school bus race. I went out there and I... Um, yeah, I won the school bus race a couple times against Kenny Wallace and Jimmy Spencer. So that I always like to rub that in their face. But little did they know at that time what you we were did a little to souped prepare up. <laughs> for the school bus race. So yeah, the the, the bags out, man. Everyone knows my secrets. Now, oh gosh, but, hey, you got you got to take advantage of it. That's right. There was no rule book. There was I was working in the there. You area. go creating opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. So the other thing I want to know, um, as you talk about broadcasting, and I've I've always thought about this and just listening to the the broadcasters and it's really easy to sit in front of my tv and and critique and and be like you know God, why they talk about that or you know why they say that or what goes into preparing for a production and and i mean you know you just don't show up on tv day and do your thing i mean there's, no. there's a lot that goes behind that Tell it may us about seem that. like we do right sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't always uh, well we, we won't call names but maybe yeah. some people do i don't know <laughs> <laughs> we try to be organized i mean i i learned when i started on air for the truck series ray dunlop actually it was a, it was a great um, influence on me who still is in the truck series and um he taught me on just simple things about putting together a notepad onto one sheet and it's basically like a eight you know eight by eleven sheet of paper and I have everything for the weekend on on what I would call a one sheeter so I do all my stat information and put it on that sheet and and prep as much as I can on every single driver and so I know all their stats and I have it in my back um, literally behind my back on my um, pack where we wear our, our gear for television and I stick it back there and I have it so it's literally instead of a notepad or a clipboard with a bunch of papers I take all my information I try to put it on one sheet and I carry that with me for the weekend so if I can um, need it for any kind of reference at any given point I have it but yes we do try to prepare and have our statistical information pretty much memorized I mean it's when you go through it and I write it all on one sheet the reason why I like I, I'm old school and I still like to write it is because it's kind of a memory thing mm -hmm. for me I get to uh, an opportunity to go over all the stats and then uh, memorize it right so you can't always grab a piece of paper especially when you're in my position on um, in the garage area interviewing drivers uh, when you're in the booth you have literally you have lots of pieces of paper in the TV booth and the radio booth in front of you and it's all laid out and um, the air conditioning's on and you're laid back <laughs> looking at all these sets <laughs> but as a garage reporter we don't have that luxury and, and I say that because I've been in the radio booth now a few times and I'm like oh this is nice there's an air conditioning up here um, so in the garage, you have to be a little bit more crafty with how you carry your notes on you. And Well, that's and what so. I was thinking about was kind of more of the uh, off the hip. You know, you've got to be in tune to what's happening in that moment. Maybe you prepared for X, Y, Z, but, you know, right. ABC happened. Right, exactly. And, yeah, uh, you can memorize all you know, the stats yeah. you want. Half the time, I'd say probably 85% of the time, I don't even regurgitate any of that information right. back on air. It's just more or less just background info that you have it if you need yeah. it. But the stuff that's reactionary in the garage and how to deal with a driver and not just... It's more than just interviewing one driver. It's all the personalities and the emotions of all those drivers. Mm -hmm. I pretty much know by just looking at your brother's face what kind of mood he's in. Because I've learned over the years, uh, over a decade of covering these drivers, when I see a certain 
face look reaction on a driver, I know what kind of interview they're going to give me before they even open their mouth. So it's pretty easy to yeah. read people. And that teaches you to, I guess, to kind of, uh, d you know, how you're going to pose your questions, right. maybe what questions you're going to ask, exactly. how you're going to ask them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's funny, you know, I, I went to, um, in, I, at college, I studied media production, but I also have a, um, a degree in psychology. And I always joke around that my psychology degree actually helps me more. <laughs> That's a, I say if, if I um, did not do what I do, I think I would enjoy psychology. I know. I, mean, I enjoy people and, and trying to figure people out and reading it and right. helping people, kind yeah. of the Dear Abby type. Yes. You know, yeah. I can give a lot better advice than I can do. and, and, and Or take my own advice. And take my, <laughs> right. And, and then to apply it to my own life. <laughs> I think everybody kind of has that trait. So you talked about your husband, Jared, works mm -hmm. at Joe Gibbs and in the, he's an engine tuner in the engine department mm -hmm. and you have a son, Caleb. Life on the road. He travels, you travel. Caleb goes along, I assume. Yes, he does. So you know what it's like on the road. It's um, it's a different lifestyle, and it's something that you just have to be accustomed to, I guess. Growing up in the garage, you know, my father raced my whole entire childhood, and I was on the road. And um, I wasn't homeschooled, so I did go to a traditional school back then. But we spent just about every weekend on the road, and then my entire summers were spent on the road as well. So we traveled as a family. My father and my mother took my brother and I to every single race. It seemed like I didn't stay home very often. I was on the road, you know, quite a bit, and I missed a lot of school. I remember um, the last year I lived in Chicago before I moved down south south my eighth grade year I think I missed like 125 days and wow. they graduated me I'm like that doesn't even happen these days like that you couldn't do that today no way so it you know because it, you know they sent work with me and I was straight A student so they just let me go it's like <laughs> that doesn't that, that's not normal so um today is a little bit different my son yes uh when we decided to have a family I said the only way we're going to do it is if we're all on the road together that's how I was raised and I feel like I turned out okay so <laughs> so we just decided to take our son on the road with us he's three and a half and obviously we're not in um you know real kindergarten yet we're still in preschool stages so he goes to preschool during the week we're home Monday Tuesdays and Wednesdays and he goes a couple days a week and then he goes on the road every Thursday with us and we um, we stay in our in, we have a motor home so we stay in an RV all weekend and there's some weekends that we may drive the motor home ourselves depending on which race weekend with my husband's um, full-time job he's usually at the shop at 630 on Monday mornings so that kind of impedes you know, the further races right. you know so we have someone that helps us on the further tracks or when my husband has a test session and he's traveling in several states in a week um, but it, it's worked out well you know he's my son's been on the road. I um, planned an off-season baby and God <laughs> agreed with my timing. I had him in December and um, it worked out. I went back to work um, for speed weeks when he was five weeks old and he's been on the road ever since five weeks old. So it's it's been a blessing and a great experience for him. I remember so many memories as a kid being on the road um, and I'm sure you do as well. Yeah, it's uh, just... Yeah so many life experiences mm -hmm. and I can see it already paying off for my three-year-old. I mean, the things that he's experienced and that he's the exposure yeah. um, just to the world, I think right. is invaluable. You know, there's so many people, uh, even, you know, my kids, friends today, you know, have never been out of their home city. Right. You know, and don't get that opportunity. So I think it's definitely that experience is, is just a great asset to have. Yeah. And I mean, simple things, you know, like flying my yeah. son, it, doesn't face my child anymore right. you know he put 30,000 miles on his first year of life <laughs> we joked about it um last year I started you know when my son turned two you have to start paying for tickets when we fly commercial and so there was one weekend he had um he had racked up so many miles on U.S. Air he had more status than me he was silver preferred <laughs> on U.S. Air and, and couldn't even walk up there on his own and wait, get anything <laughs> this, it gets better so my son and I are flying and I think I don't know I think we were going to Dover or something like that and so we're flying commercial and all of a sudden I get this email pop up on my email and it says that my son um, has been upgraded to first class. <laughs> And then the it says below it that that I, because I was a passenger on his itinerary that it upgraded me as well because of his status. So I took this email and I like screenshot it. I put it. I sent it to all our family. I'm like, my son is finally taking me places at three years old. He has upgraded his mommy to first class. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's a great story. <laughs> so what's your week like in terms of, um, you know, you're working Thursday to Sunday. What's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for you? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is great 
catching up time on errands, laundry. I said I have a, um, a, nice, a nice laundry mat with my house that I go to and I do laundry and then I leave again. Um, but between um, being a mom, so my son is at preschool during the school year right now. We're in summer break. So he's um, going to preschool. So I'm, you know, just like a typical mom, a carpool mom, dropping them off. They have a carpool line. I pick them back up for, for preschool on Mondays and Wednesdays and um, running errands, getting laundry done turning things around in our motor home, um, grocery shopping, typical mom stuff, just yep. like every other mom would do out there. And um, I do, I record my podcast sometimes. Um, either I go there or I've done it at the race. I try to do it at the racetrack. It doesn't always happen. So sometimes I'm recording during the weekdays as well. But um, we sometimes will have a shoot come up for Fox. Not always, but if I go to a driver's home or record a feature story or something like that they may call me to do that but otherwise monday tuesday wednesdays are kind of my days at home to catch up and then thursdays we leave again and and at the track Starts sunday night <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you talked about your podcast racing home mm -hmm. been a fun experience for you yeah it's cool so doug rice at performance racing network um he's the president at prn he gave me this great opportunity to start this podcast this season and it's just a little homegrown podcast you know how it is you have people you call them up you interview them and all of a sudden you call it a podcast so, you exactly know, it's, yep. it's it's great it's a great opportunity it's great for the fans to be able to log on and listen and and learn more about people in the industry so i don't typically interview drivers or crew chiefs i tend to stay away from that there are so many other people in our industry that have stories and and that's what i love to get out and, and we call it racing home because it is a lifestyle it's about about your your families and life on the road and um, a lot of the crew members that leave their families behind what do they go through on a weekly basis because it's so different from a driver's perspective as well so it's been fun i'm i'm really appreciative of everything i've done um this season with prn that sounds fun. Yeah, Doug. Doug's a great uh, person. You guys had Carson on. Yes. Um, uh, your Monday she, night. I loved that. <laughs> She's a ball of energy. I just love it. She's so funny. Well, you can be that Benny Parsons for her <laughs> and give her some mentorship for. I, I would love to see her follow the path of some sort of broadcast or, or something like that because I think she has the personality and, and she the does. quick wit and. And all for it. Um, she does. She is. She's. If I can get that racing bug out of her to drive. <laughs> <laughs> she's well, having fun with it. Well, I don't know where she's going to go with that. The apple doesn't fall right, far, far right. from the tree, right? Oh, I know. It's a, everyone says, is your son going to race? Because he's three and a half. And my mom and dad um, have a quarter midget sitting in the race shop. And ready. Yes. And so my son hops in it when he's at the race shop at Venturini Motorsports and he thinks it is his quarter midget, which I mean, he can get in it at any point, but he can't reach the pedals yet. He's three and a half, but I know they start racing, practicing at four and racing at five and those things. I'm like, oh, just go to golf or something. I know. <laughs> I don't get too worried with what uh, Carson and Kennedy are doing these days, uh, you know, small track and, and it just isn't that bad, but. She talks sprint cars, and I'm like, honey, I just, I don't, I don't think I can stomach it. Yes. I just don't think I tough. can stomach it. <laughs> it would be tough. It's, it is, you know, it's different when you're, when your mom, it was when, when my dad was racing and when my brother was racing, it is, it's, I mean, you accept it. You know yeah. what your family is into, but it, I think it would change the, the tune a little bit when it's your child. <laughs> yeah, it does. The tune does change. <laughs> I can, I can uh, attest to that as well. We talked about PRN and, and Doug Rice and the different opportunities that you have. And, and coming up here for the September Loudon race, you are going to be the first woman to co-anchor a Sprint Cup race broadcast I know, for PRN. I it, know. It's pretty crazy. I, I, again, it's, you know, I've just like yourself, you don't set out to be the first female to do X, Y, Z in your career. Things just happen. And if you're the first female to accomplish a certain goal, then then so be it. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm very blessed. Um, but I started um, doing nationwide races last year. Doug Rice invited me to go in the booth, and I thought, this is crazy. I've never done this before. So I've learned a lot since calling my first nationwide race, and I've had the opportunity to co-anchor the nationwide races for the 2014 season along with Mark Garrow in the booth for PRN. So it's been a great opportunity, but Doug called me to do my first Sprint Cup race, which will be September, the Loudoun race, not uh, not this week, in the Loudoun September race. So it's going to be a great opportunity. I'm excited and I, I don't know. I don't get nervous about things because I'm just doing what I've always been doing. 
Um, but I think there's a lot more pressure involved now because all eyes, all ears, whatever the case may be, will be on that weekend and what, what I'm doing up there and people will be tuning in just to listen to the first time a female has called a sprint cup race from the radio broadcast booth. So it's cool. It's, it's a good thing, you know, when I'm not on this earth any longer, that's so somebody else can talk about. <laughs> I know. And we, I've talked about this before in different situations and scenario about being the first female or, or really calling out the female element. First off, the first female, you give her the opportunity for there to be a second and a third and a fourth. So, right. you know, I think we have to pat ourselves on the back when, when that opportunity comes our way. But it's such a fine line to to be called out really from any minority standpoint, whether you're Hispanic or or African-American or female or whatever it is, um, you want to use that, you know, to call attention and create more opportunities. But, you know, then there's the other side of it of, you know, kind of using it as a crutch to get something, you know, right. And, and I think that, um, you know, I like your perspective on that and and how you feel about that as well. Well, And that's the thing, you know, it's, we see so many females in our industry because there's aren't, there aren't a lot of uh, uh, of females doing things in, in motorsports, comparatively speaking, what I think right. there could be. Right. And so it's, you know, I've heard Danica say it, you know, the race car doesn't know if I'm male or female, you know, the microphone doesn't know, the TV camera, you know, yes, the TV camera will see, obviously, but... But it's just, you go out and, and you're doing the best job you can. And if I was a male in this position, would they be drawing attention? Probably not. But it is creating opportunities for the future. And uh, there's a lot of young girls that come up to me and say, I want to do what you do. I want to be, you know, I want to have your job. And uh, one day I'm going to say, okay, here you go. Have it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so it's creating opportunities for more females to come into our sport and, and do this. And, and that's a cool thing to um to experience and to be a part of so i appreciate what prn has done and and what doug rice and marcus smith and and all the folks in smi have done to um to create those opportunities in nascar so last week i introduced charlie soap as the new sponsor of fast lane family and wanted you guys to uh give me some feedback on the product uh if you've used the product before tell me what you thought about it or if you haven't go out and and use it or research and read up about it many of you did just that and i want to thank you for providing your comments to me on twitter several of you have used it and love it glad to hear that uh, i have my own experience i'll talk about here in just a few minutes camping a few of you wanted to know does it smell good they have a funny you know caption amanda um if you want flowers go pick them so so it's not <laughs> Very scented, yeah. um, which I yeah. don't think it has I don't a think it's a bad all. thing. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I don't like for all that scent to be on my clothing and stuff. Anyway, my husband really doesn't like that either. So <laughs> it's a man thing. As I a think. hunter, yeah, <laughs> as a hunter, we can't scent scent up the house. Um, and several of you wanted to know where to get the product, and you know you can go online at charliesoap.com. They have a store located there. You can. It's in a wide variety of specialty stores that carry green products and and non toxic products. So there's a store located that you can find all those things about. I took the product camping this weekend. Uh, my husband and Wyatt and Kennedy, and we took our cousins Claudia and Callahan camping on Wednesday after work, and we went to the North Carolina mountains. So I grabbed the indoor outdoor cleaner thinking that might come in handy. And I grabbed the kitchen and bath cleaner. I was able to use both of them. You know, use the outdoor. I I, uh, sprayed along the camper and and tried to take off a couple spots of the the bugs and and whatnot. Yeah, from traveling with the camper. You know, wiped up some of the uh, chairs and whatnot outside. And the product worked like a charm. I came home from camping, used the kitchen and bath product to clean up. I think I tweeted about that on uh, Sunday while we were in and out of the race with the rain delay. We were cleaning up the camper and, and I always like to go through and vacuum and mop the floors and go ahead and wipe down the bathrooms and all that stuff before we put it up. So I used the product, you know, on the counters and, and the bathrooms and uh, sinks and all that good stuff and um, was really pleased with how it worked. Yeah, I actually used the, the bathroom as well. I cleaned one of my bathrooms in the house and what just I liked. one of them? It, yeah, it was just one. I don't even know why. I, I think it was just just like that day, I was like, well, let's tackle this bathroom. But <laughs> you got to get in the mood to tackle yeah, bathrooms. Yeah. So, but it, what I liked about it is it, like you said, it doesn't have a smell. And I'm so used to like the Lysol yeah. products and all that where you're just kind of overwhelmed by it. But after I was done, I was like, huh, this is actually not bad. And it cleaned really well. So I was, I was really happy. I'm excited that we've got this sponsorship. I think so many times the smell masks, you know, you, yeah, it kind of, you walk in somewhere and you're like, oh, that smells clean, but is it really clean kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah, um, yeah. the product, I'm, I've, I've, I'm pleased so far. I am using the laundry detergent consistently, and I'm finding that to be, you know, just perfect and uh, no problems there. And 
So far, so good. You can go online now to charliesoap.com and check out their full line of products. You can even purchase them online on their site. And you can use their store locator to find a retail store near you carrying their product. We also want to hear from you. So test out their products with me and send me a tweet to let me know what you think. And we'll start airing your responses right here on Fast Lane Family. Okay, it's time for Ask Kelly. Remember that you can submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag Ask Kelly at my handle, Earnhardt Kelly. And we also take questions on my Facebook page, Kelly K. Earnhardt. Our first question is from Mandy Alvarado on Facebook. What was your favorite chick flick movie? I think I would have to say, I guess, two. My my favorite chick flick, I guess, is Legally Blonde. (laughs) One and two. I mean, they're just so funny. Just so goofy funny. Um, And I'm also, I love Grease. I could watch Grease over and over and over and over again. So I'll go with those. This is from Leanne23. That's her Twitter handle. So this is from Twitter. Uh, Do you bring your dogs to work? Because she sees Killer is here sometimes. I do not bring my dogs to work. <laughs> um, one, because they're one's 75 pounds, one ninety, one's 90 pounds. They've never, you know, been the kind of bring your dogs to work kind of dogs. But Killer is here from time to time. Amy and Dale travel with both Junebug and Killer uh, for the most part. But Killer is left behind um, from time to time and I keep him. And there's another, our, our receptionist, Renee, also keeps Killer. So um, that's the reason that you'll see him because he travels along with us. Killer is a member of, you know, he's an employee of Junior Motorsports. He has his own airplane seat, has his own place in the motorhome. So he's a he's pretty spoiled and special. <laughs> this next question is also from Twitter, and Twitter handle is at 88 till I die. Have you ever done anything to embarrass yourself in public? <laughs> The first thing that comes to mind, and I'm sure I've done a gazillion things to embarrass myself in public, but the first thing that comes to mind was in college. And you can imagine it was pretty embarrassing because, you know, your college peers that you're around. But I had to pee so bad. And we were coming down the hallway to our dorm room. And something happened, and my roommate, Whatever she said, I just busted to the point I could not hold it anymore. And I peed right in the middle of the dorm hallway floor my first year of college. As you can imagine, that was pretty embarrassing. (laughs) (laughs) Would you tell that story? (laughs) Well, it could have been worse. It could have been out in like a whole big mess. There were people in the the hallway, but um, it was was pretty embarrassing. (laughs) Well, I certainly appreciate you um, being with me today. I've got for having me. a few more, my, my final thoughts for you today. They're nice and easy. <laughs> sweet or salty? Uh, sweet. Beach or mountains? Beach, for sure. Dogs or cats? Ooh, dogs. I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> Most people, these they want to say, can I not pick both? You were very clear on that one. <laughs> Hills or flats? Oh, I have, well, look at them, I'm wearing a wedge sandal right now. I'm going to say heels, although I wear flats in the garage area. I would want to make that clear. Okay. Massage or facial? Facial, because, you know, we need help in this area on television. <laughs> Cooking or eat out? Oh, you know, that's a funny one. My husband loves my cooking. I hate to cook. <laughs> so there you have it, eat out. <laughs> We're asking you, not him, right? <laughs> uh, dress and dress or jeans and a tee? Uh, jeans and a tee. City girl, country girl. City girl. I'm from Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, that concludes today's Fast Lane Family. I hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks for listening to Dirty Mo Radio. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Fast Lane Family today and to all the Dirty Mo Radio podcast each week. And thank you again to our new sponsor, Charlie Soap. Go online now to charliesoap.com and check out their unbelievable line of cleaning products. The best part about the products is that they're all green, so you can safely tackle all your tough jobs. Help support the people that help support us. Go to charliesoap.com today to purchase their full line of products.